Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will come to order. Today the subcommittee will focus on a subject of significant public health concern, the issue of dangerous lead release from housewares in this country. The adverse health effects of lead have been documented for hundreds of years, but many consumers in 1988 are totally unaware of the hazards posed by lead glazes and decorations which have been improperly formulated, applied, or fired. Some consumers, aware that the Romans suffered from lead poisoning caused by the consumption of wine from lead-lined jugs, erroneously assumed that the problem of lead poisoning from ceramic ware disappeared with the decline of the Roman Empire. Others may be aware of the hazards posed by Mexican pottery fired at low temperatures but falsely believe that all ceramic ware and glassware available for purchase in the United States is now completely safe. Unfortunately, these assumptions are incorrect. In fiscal year 1987, the Food and Drug Administration recalled hazardous ceramic ware from 21 firms, including such well-known retailers as Macy's, China Bazaar, Nordstrom's, Brookstone, Pier 1 Import, and Williams-Sonoma. While imported ceramic ware experienced the highest violation rates during this period, problems also were identified with ceramic ware manufactured at several small domestic potteries. In view of this widespread lack of knowledge about the nature and extent of the risks posed by defective ceramic ware and glassware, one of the major purposes of today's hearing is to inform the public about these risks. Without adequate education about this problem, many individuals will continue to purchase dangerous items for food service. The subcommittee's hearing also will probe the adequacy of the quality assurance procedures of ceramic ware manufacturers, importers, and retailers to assure that domestic and imported housewares do not pose a health threat to consumers. Our review to date has revealed gaping holes in many of the corporate quality control programs. Even more importantly, our investigation has uncovered serious deficiencies in the Food and Drug Administration's effort to implement effective lead release guidelines, monitor industry compliance with these guidelines, and take effective enforcement action against firms that violate the rules. Given this situation, is not, it is not at all surprising that housewares posing a health hazard continue to flow into the channels of commerce around this country. Today's hearing is part of a broader inquiry undertaken by the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations into the Health Hazards of Lead. In 1986, the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act mandated the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry to submit a comprehensive report to the Congress on the nature and extent of lead poisoning in children. Regrettably, it now appears that administration officials are irresponsibly delaying the release of this important report, this important public health report, to the American people. Our first witnesses today will be Don and Fran Wallace, a Seattle couple who suffered serious lead poisoning caused by the use of improperly glazed Italian coffee mugs. Since their recovery, this couple has been actively engaged in consumer protection efforts, and they have been personally responsible for triggering many of FDA's ceramic ware recalls in recent years. I'll be particularly interested in hearing from the Wallaces on the problem of the mobile glasses, as many of uh, my colleagues and staff know there's a, been a particular problem with these glasses. Citizens around this country would go up to gas pumps and if they uh, purchased lead-free gas, they were given a lead-glazed glass. And we suspect that there are millions of these glasses that are being used around this country I've recently been informed by the Food and Drug Administration that these glasses contain far, far more lead than is acceptable under the voluntary standards promulgated by the Food and Drug Administration. And at the hearing, I also plan to release 
a memo from the Food and Drug Administration indicating that the voluntary standard has been ineffective and that the agency has been remiss in requiring companies to keep track of relevant documents with respect to uh, materials needed to comply with this voluntary standard. So we will look forward to the Wallaces and the chair wants to welcome them in particular as fellow residents of the Pacific Northwest. The subcommittee is also going to hear from a panel of federal officials including representatives from the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences about the health hazards posed by lead exposure. In addition, the Food and Drug Administration will discuss the agency's current standards governing lead release from housewares and the operation of the agency's compliance program for domestic and imported uh, housewares. Finally, the subcommittee will receive testimony from representatives of the domestic ceramic ware industry and ceramic ware importers about industry quality assurance programs. Throughout the day, the subcommittee hopes to uh, identify recommendations for action which must be initiated to improve the protection of the public health. We'd now like to welcome Don and Fran Wallace who, have, as I've said, have played a major role at great uh, public expense and sacrifice to advocate uh, to the Congress and the public about these important public uh, health problems. If Mr. and Ms. Wallace will come forward, uh, we welcome you. Please be seated and we'll briefly explain the rules of, uh, of the subcommittee. Let me just uh, make a correction. That expense that you all incurred was great personal expense and not great public expense. And uh, I want to make that clear for, uh, for the record. Mr. and Ms. Wallace, we welcome you. It is the practice of our subcommittee to swear all witnesses. Do either of you uh, have any objection to being sworn as witnesses today? No. Please rise and raise your right hand. You saw me swear the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth stuff you got? I do. Let me also advise you of your right to be represented by counsel uh, throughout your appearance today. Do either of you desire to be represented by counsel? No, we do not. Uh, I also uh, note the presence of, uh, of the rules there uh, for your use throughout uh, uh, your appearance today. We will make a copy of your prepared remarks a part of the record uh, in their entirety and uh, we welcome you and thank you for your leadership and your effective advocacy for the public uh, public health. Please proceed and uh, Mr. Wallace I gather you would like to begin? Yes, uh, uh, we have prepared a joint testimony but uh, we have discussed it and I will present the testimony. As Chairman Dingle likes to note we have infernal microphones and let us uh, there we okay. go. Yeah, he's we have prepared a joint testimony, uh, however I will present it in behalf of the both of us. When the questioning and answer periods come, we will both uh, uh, are prepared to, do, to take the questions. My name is Donald M. Wallace, and with me today is my wife, Frances A. Wallace. We are grateful for this opportunity to present our testimony at this important hearing. Thank you for inviting us. An overview of our presentation. In correspondence to us earlier, Congressman Dingell stated that the subcommittee is interested in our testimony as victims of lead poisoning caused by improperly glazed ceramic ware. He also requested specific information regarding the following subjects, and there are five of them. We'll cover them in order. Our symptoms, delayed diagnosis, and eventual recovery. The consumer protection efforts initiation of recalls from the marketplace, the means that we have for consumers to test for lead release, and finally, recommendations to improve safety of household products. Our near fatal experience as victims of lead poisoning caused by Italian coffee mugs dates back almost a decade. Our research on the potential of lead exposure for persons using defective ceramic ware and decorated glassware 
has been ongoing for over seven years. We've concluded that a significant worldwide public health problem exists. The detailed background information on the complications intrinsic to our own case is, has been provided in our written testimony and in the attachments. Our verbal testimony will cover the most significant observations, findings, and conclusions and recommendations that we have had in our research to date. First of all, regarding our symptoms, Fran and I, over a period of three years, were systemically poisoned by the same source. We were under medical care of the finest physicians. I was a combat uh, fighter pilot in the Air Force. I was a career officer. We were looked at by military physicians, uh, civilian doctors, medical teams, and we had a variety of misdiagnoses. It, uh, in the 20th century today, it's difficult for us to see how such an age-old disease, well-known, recognized, could have uh, been missed by so many physicians. In Fran's case, she suffered from severe gastrointestinal problems, constipation, she was anemic, she had peripheral neuropathy, she went through extreme pain. This occurred first about six months after we purchased dinnerware while stationed in southern Italy in 1977-78. Six months later, we were en route to a uh, diplomatic posting. Later on, I had symptoms too. I went through two operations, one on each wrist for pains that occurred in my arms, which were uh, diagnosed as being carpal tunnel syndrome. They were not. In Fran's case, she was first diagnosed as having a rare genetic disease called acute intermittent porphyria. It has an incidence rate of something like one, one in 100,000. The doctors were keyed to the various peripheral neuropathies that were associated with the porphyrias. They missed totally the fact that lead poisoning mimics many diseases. We came back to Seattle. I retired from the Air Force after non-acceptance of an assignment that was undesirable to me. I was a career officer. And uh, we retired, took an early retirement. Fran fell ill about three months after we begun again using the dinnerware. This time she was diagnosed as an even more rare form of porphyria called a uh, copral porphyria or variegate porphyria in exacerbation. The doctors were going to perform some brand new type treatments for her and uh, she was near death in, in the hospital. I, ex I was an aircraft accident investigator in the Air Force. I was the headquarters Air Force safety inspector. And I went to the University of Washington and studied at the medical school library and we eventually put two and two together. It's in our testimony that lead poisoning can not only cause the anemia that was puzzling the doctors, but it could also cover all of the other symptoms, the wide gamut of flu-like symptoms, the gastrointestinal problems, that Fran was suffering. The key point that we're trying to make here with this is that although we were suffering from, Fran was suffering from a disease of lead poisoning, it took uh, an awful lot of persuasion on our part to get doctors to recognize that she had the disease because they associated it only with occupational exposures. Subsequent to Fran being diagnosed with lead poisoning, I was also diagnosed. My level of blood lead was 144 micrograms per deciliter, and that compares to 100 being a medical emergency. Both of us went through the treatment, which is chelation therapy using EDTA, calcium disodium editate, and uh, over a two week period we were treated, our blood lead levels did come down. After this, I entered graduate school. We started a life over and we began pursuing the intricacies of lead poisoning to define the hazard. We were particularly interested in finding out why the cups that we had pinned it to in Italy actually poisoned us. We did, we found it, and after three years, in the writing of a, which to us was a voluminous thesis, since it was done on a mechanical typewriter, non-correcting, non we decided that we would enter into a further research to define the problem and to uh, protect consumers. Our initial consumer protection efforts were related to uh, defining the problem, uh, writing it up, 
uh, we had some contacts with industries, and then we began looking at the overall scope of the problem, identified dinnerware, all of which manufactured in the United States before 1971, is suspect because there was no existence of laws at that time for the control of lead or heavy metals from, uh, from uh, blazes. We also found that imported ware, ware that people buy, tourists as such, other countries, no law, uh, there will be no law for lead release, or oftentimes if there is a law, there's virtually no enforcement. We begin then after, uh, uh, this was three, two years after our recovery, to initiate recalls from the marketplace. We would test dinnerware, and when we found some items that uh, were, that we uh, documented as having high lead release, we would notify the Food and Drug Administration, and we would have them recalled. Our first recalls were from smaller shops, and some that our recall consisted of just buying their stock, and uh, uh, if they only had three or four items. Later on, the FDA became aware, and we made them aware, and we initiated recalls from companies, for instance, Williams-Sonoma. On the my left of the table in the far back, there's a multicolored pitcher from Italy. That is a Valencia jug. It sold some, for something like $32 in a mail order catalog in stores. We identified those as having high lead release, and they were subsequently recalled as was the earthenware baking dish from Spain, which is in front, and uh, those were recalled as well. As our research continued, and Fran had developed a tremendous ability to walk into a store and with her eyes pick out a particular piece that was suspect, and she, it just proved, it proved itself over and over again. She could walk in and to many different stores, and she would say, that looked suspicious. We would buy it, and upon testing, I would say that she ran a 30 to 40, maybe even 50% success rate. Some of the levels were up into the hundreds of parts per million. We recalled from Pier 1 Imports a number of times, and you can see the yellow and blue pictures up there, blue bowls, they were recalled. And we did this for a number, for a long period, probably two or three years. The most recent recall that we have been, that we have been involved with is the Decimone, Giovanni Decimone dinnerware made in Italy, and uh, that has been recalled from stores all over the United States and Canada. In 1987, we were provided the patent license to a test kit, which dramatically improved our ability to identify items in the marketplace that leach high amounts of lead. The test kit is on the right side of my right, front of the uh, table. It consists of a test solution, a, an observation dish, and the consumer supplies white distilled vinegar. In February, for example, of this year, we, went, we were invited to Italy. We went to Rome, walked the streets of Rome, picked out items, screened them using our test kit, and subsequently, Italian laboratories documented extremely high lead release. And uh, in view of the time, I'd like to go into the mobile glass issue with uh, concurrence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have made, as I say, many recalls, and we're particularly interested at one point in glasses that were uh, painted with lead on the inside. And you'll see them on the display table on the right. They're the black with gold. These, or and the white ones with gold, these have high lead releasing paint on the interior surface, drinking surface. We know of seven documented cases in the literature from, uh, where these have been involved in poisoning. The tumbler that's black came from, originally from Portland, Oregon, where it was purchased 40 years ago for the 20th wedding anniversary of a, an engineer's wife. It was there uh, for her, her mother's and father's 20th wedding anniversary. Subsequently, those glasses were used by the couple. Uh, uh, they inherited them, so to speak. They began dishwashing them. They had lead poisoning in which Mr. Uh, the architect 
had his gallbladder removed, went through all kinds of problems before. The doctors put together that the wife, too, was anemic. She ended up in the hospital. They were both acutely lead poisoned. That's a recent case. It happened in 1986. The history goes back to those glasses many years. We go from the interior of the glass to some of the glasses that we purchased on the streets of Italy, and you can see them in the front row. They have lead paint now up on the lip rim area that dissolves just like sugar when it comes in contact with a very weak acid. Some of uh, the white or the yellow rimmed glass, that's, there's only one with yellow rim on the table, 477 parts per million. Now we come to the fact that in early this year, probably in February, we read newspaper accounts that the wrong type, we had heard that the wrong type enamel or high lead releasing enamel came on some glasses that were given out in considerable numbers. So we reviewed these and we were hoping that at least people would be warned that, the, that this was uh, a dangerous situation. At one point I was called by a reporter from U.S. Oil Week and uh, he further uh, mentioned to me that both the manufacturer of the glasses and the distributor of the glasses maintained that they were safe. We then got some glasses. We knew that there were millions of them there available. We got them and we tested them. We first screened them using our test kit. We discovered if we immersed the glass into a beaker upside down with distilled vinegar that in a matter of minutes high levels of lead were indicated. So we took the glasses down to Northwest Laboratories in Seattle. They did an immersion test using 4% acetic acid for 24 hours, 250 milliliters, and they let it, uh, uh, the, the glass sit there. One of the lion's glasses is on display. We did two lion's glasses and then, uh, then another type. They got 1,275 parts per million of lead into that 250 milliliters of 4% acetic acid. That's a large number, it's gross. We then saw that uh, we made other tests. Uh, the manufacturer then, according to newspaper accounts, and by the way, we have never spoken with a representative of the manufacturer one time. No contact whatsoever. Excuse me for interrupting. The manufacturer is Libby Glass. Libby Glass. Thank you. To the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, we have never made contact with any man uh, manufacturer's representative. We have talked to the public relations of Mobile, Mr. Chairman. But we read newspaper accounts, several of them, that said significant lead release only occurs with prolonged exposure to highly acidic solutions at temperatures above 100 degrees. That particular statement doesn't really say anything. We wanted to quantitate it. So after doing some experimentation, we sent a glass to uh, Elemental Research, a high-tech laboratory in Vancouver, British Columbia. They use uh, ICP mass spec, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. In, we use 7-Up, which has a pH of 3.1. It cannot be called a uh, highly acidic solution. It came out of the refrigerator at a temperature of 5 degrees centigrade or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, so it really wasn't above 100 degrees. And we immersed the glass for minutes, not a prolonged time period, simply by putting 100 milliliters of the 7-Up into a beaker, immersing the glass, and measuring lead release over 1, 2, 5, and 12 minutes. We ended up with 2.5 parts per million in one minute, 5 parts per million, seven parts per million rather in two minutes, 22 parts per million uh, in five minutes, and 39 parts per million in 12 minutes. And that, that synopsis is, forms an attachment. Without going into numbers, it's over 4,000 micrograms of lead into seven up in 12 minutes, which we feel is dangerous. I'd like to now go into, if I could, just our, quickly our recommendations for consumer safety. Number one, the lead release standards that were set in this country in 1971 finally changed in 1980, leave the consumer at a negative margin of safety. In other words, if vessels were indeed uh, constructed, manufactured, that would leach at or near those levels, uh, people would uh, clearly be lead poisoned if they uh, served or ate food that was served in them. 
So our first recommendation is that we would like to see the standard that is set that's clearly in violation of uh, acceptable uh, a standard by the by the medical community. We'd like to see the standard for the manufacturing community set in accordance with the latest medical knowledge. So they should be lowered immediately, the FDA standard, to bring them in line with the most current studies on lead toxicity. Further, the use of a voluntary standard for control of, of lead and other toxic metal released from ceramics should be eliminated. This would preclude delays in notifying customers of defective products, and it would also enhance the recall ability of enforcement agencies. In addition, the current method for testing for the defective uh, ceramic ware by using the lip and rim method or area should be eliminated. And the FDA guideline for lead release from ceramic should also be applied for, to glassware. Probably of most importance of all into this hearing is the fact that studies should be conducted to clearly define the extent of the hazard in the United States and in other countries as well, from the increased lead uptake from the use of ceramics. And finally, I have some others uh, which are covered in my written testimony, but we want to stress that the use of the X-ray fluorescence device the uh, in vivo tibial x-ray fluorescence should receive the highest priority in epidemiologic investigations, including the forthcoming uh, National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey 3, because this, we have developed the means now for the consumer to screen for his or her own risk in the kitchen and identify dangerous vessels. Now, the medical community, on the other hand, has also developed a prototype that appears very good to assess the amount of lead that accumulates in the body. Uh, we would like cooperation, coordination with the Food and Drug Administration to particularly warn members of the DOD, the Department of State, and the tourists that are go overseas, but particularly those two, two departments, the government that send people, like myself and my wife, on diplomatic postings or with the military into situations where pottery like this that we have found with uh, defective lead glazes is sold and it's brought back. The FDA has no control over items like that. They're limited solely to domestically produced dinnerware that's uh, involved in interstate commerce and also commercially imported dinnerware. I think we have definitely used up Ten minutes. Well, Mr. Wallace, let me thank you for an excellent presentation and for the courage that you and your wife have shown in tackling this, this problem really in the interest of all citizens, not just in the interest of your own health, and I want to commend you. I'm going to recognize my colleague from Kansas, but just before I do, very briefly, I wanted to uh, note uh, your interest in uh, changing that voluntary standard for lead in uh, glassware in particular. Uh, the subcommittee has gotten a memo uh, of a meeting between the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and industry leaders in May of 1988, May 16th of 1988. And in that memo, L. Robert Lake, the director of the Office of Compliance for the Center for Food Safety and Applied uh, Nutrition, states uh, the fact that the voluntary standard and record uh, availability agreement appear to have been ineffective. So I think even the Food and Drug Administration is coming around, particularly those who are in charge of compliance, with your view that uh, the voluntary standard has been uh, inadequate, ineffective to protect the public interest, and it's some indication that the federal government is finally starting to listen to the fine work that you all have been doing. Let me recognize my colleague uh, from Kansas for, uh, for questions to begin with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wallace and Ms. Wallace, in your testimony today, you uh, described the pain and suffering that you experienced over a three-year period of time as a result of lead poisoning from improperly glazed uh, ceramic ware. 
based on your discussions with medical experts and your review of the medical literature, do you believe that your health problems are over or do you believe this is something that you're going to be dealing with for years to come? What, what's the prognosis for your individual health situation? According to all of the medical literature that we have been reviewing the last two years, uh, which has uh, uh, actually concerned us a great deal because so much more is coming out now on the hazards of, of uh, lead in the body, we uh, are extremely concerned with the future of our health because the long-term effects of lead are uh, quite unknown, really. The idea that, um, you know, when Don was talking about the uh, uh, in vivo tibial x-ray fluorescence would tell us something, if that were available, uh, what we perhaps could expect in the future. It's already clearly, well, it's clearly documented the damage to the kidney, uh, the connection between lead hypertension and the kidney. Uh, I think Dr. Wedeen has made that real clear in his research, his studies, and his writings. Uh, as well as other colleagues. It's, it's clear throughout all the medical literature that we have come across that the deleterious effects are long-lasting. We just don't know how bad it's going to be. We just don't know when the body will cave in completely. We have no idea. Have very many people um, come forward and, and indicated that they have uh, experienced similar health problems after learning of your experience? In, in your part of the country? We have had cases of that where uh, uh, people have written to us. Uh, they have, uh, or we've made it a point to become in contact with them, where uh, very serious symptoms resolved after discontinuance of in use of functional dinnerware that they had been using that we showed leached high levels of lead. Mm -hmm. And the case studies that we're developing are few in number right now, but it appears beyond a shadow of a doubt to us that it's going to increase exponentially. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, that uh, we are in the process currently of dealing with some people in Canada. We appeared on nationwide TV in Canada, had 20,000 letters. Among these uh, was a person that for 40 years suffered uh, from an untold number of ailments. Subsequent testing of his dinnerware revealed that he did you that they did release high levels of lead. Since becoming involved in this whole question yourselves, have you undertaken to, to go out to some department stores or wherever this kind of dinnerware might be sold and just randomly test uh, dinnerware that's being uh, sold in stores in your part of the country? And if so, I'm just curious what kind of results you, uh, you ran into. How serious is the problem, in other words? Well, actually, the the problem is quite serious because it's it's out there by the boatload here and there. Mm -hmm. And have you have you actually gone into department stores and say, for example, buy some some dinnerware? Constantly. Yeah. Pardon me. Constantly, uh -huh. I do it all the time. Yes, yeah, what, what, what recalls, Mr. Lauderdale, were uh, uh, from Nordstrom, Gumps, Neiman, and Marcus. We would buy uh, Pier One. Uh, we have literally gone and uh, done our own market survey over the last three years. We spent uh, not tens of thousands, probably over $100,000 in buying retail uh, merchandise, screening it, and when we find a bad item, we report it to the Food and Drug Administration do you, for recall. Do you have uh, the names of, of companies that are, that are selling uh, dinnerware that has high lead content? Or do you have names of producers that are consistently selling, in your opinion, dinnerware with high lead content? Going back to 1986, uh, I'll give Pier 1 serves as the best example. We bought a number of items from there, from them. Uh, the pitchers, bowls, a number of pitchers. And uh, we, over a period of year, I believe, made seven or eight uh, recalls. The pitcher that saw two year left there was mm -hmm. our most recent recall from Pier 1 that was identified by Fran uh, as suspect in the University District of Seattle in late, I believe, December. It was reintroduced along with a bowl and another smaller picture by Pier 1 Imports with a stick-on sticker that said caution may poison food. 
used for decorative purposes only. On the bottom, there is a uh, manufacturer's label that's under the glaze, only in most cases it's illegible. Mm -hmm. It'll say something uh, de Italia, and underneath that it'll say for decorative purposes only, only it's very difficult to read. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an example of items that we purchased a number of. We probably purchased two or three, four thousand dollars worth from Pier 1 alone. The same from Williams Sonoma, to identify them, test them, and uh, and initiate recalls. That uh, subsequently, that picture that's near you was subsequently uh, pulled totally off the market. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, how much or what percentage of of the dinnerware that you're that you have looked at has been marked for decorative use only, as opposed to that which is not? Oh, none of it is marked for decorative use only. Well, I mean, this is. That happens to be the only one. Mm -hmm. That was one that just, I, I picked that up simply to make a point mm -hmm. that here is a picture that is perhaps in that you could discern for decorative use only. No one could read it. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a leecher of lead. It's an obvious leecher. We haven't bought, Mr. Uh, Mr. Splatterly, any of the items that are marked for decorative purposes only. It serves us no purpose unless we can see that it's a clearly functional item. If it's all obviously a wall plaque or something, it's not of interest. It's what is functional and that the consumer would perceive as being useful in the kitchen for, uh, for holding or serving liquid foods. Mr. Wallace, in testimony to be delivered later today, um, I'm advised that the president of Pier 1 plans to testify that that his company, and I quote from his, his uh, testimony, cannot cite this subcommittee to any confirmed report that any of its ceramic products have actually harmed any consumer. This is after the sale of literally hundreds of thousands of ceramic items over a quarter of a century from suppliers that span the globe. No, Do you have any evidence that consumers have been injured by oh, absolutely. products made available uh, from Pier 1? One just Pier has to one. look at the voluminous number. We're talking in the billions of pieces that are out there of defective dinnerware. Number two, combine it to the fact that probably uh, 50 or 60 doctors looked at Fran and myself before we were finally diagnosed over a period of three years as having lead poisoning. Uh, I went through two unnecessary operations. In the literature, you're going to find cases that have occurred up to the current time where uh, uh, dishes have been bought and uh, remained unused for periods of possibly 40, 50, 60 years until lead poisoning is fi finally manifested in someone. You combine this with the fact that low-level lead toxicity, the symptoms are varied and there's no real measurement. The bone uh, blood lead is not necessarily a good test for a long-term chronic exposure to lead. Lead can be considered like uh, lead poisoning like asbestos. It maybe has a 20 to 30-year latency period on the long-term chronic buildup before it's diagnosed. So it doesn't surprise me at all that a certain manufacturer or retailer can make a statement. That statement is an actual uh, reverse portrayal of the problem that we want to bring to the attention, that lead poisoning is unrecognized. Mm -hmm. okay. Time of gentleman's expired. Gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, I'd like to understand something. In the, in the case of almost all of the earthenware and uh, those items on the table, uh, those items contained, uh, allegedly contained lead inside the container. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, in the glaze or in the paints and decorations or decals used underneath the glaze. Initially, we but the, were... The, excuse me. The, those uh, items, for the most part, that, that I'm looking at, uh, the liquid or the food actually came into contact with the uh, glaze and with the lead. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I wonder if, John, if you could get me a, one of those uh, NFL glasses. Get the Lions one. <laughs> I'm a Lions famous chairman, so this is appropriate. The um, a long-suffering one, I might add. This um, this glass that uh, that you also had up there with the others. Um, this the treatment on the is on the outside. Is that correct? 
That is correct. So that there's no chance of the lead or any of the glaze coming into contact with the liquid inside the glass. Is that correct? That is not correct in our That's estimation. Not correct. How, how would the, um, how would I potentially be poisoned by lead if I uh, drank out of this particular container? Well, if I could use an example, it, this, uh, and it can be of any sex, but a grandchild four and a half years old, just simply serve them a soft drink with ice cubes inside the glass and watch them for about 10 minutes. You'll see that the hand-to-mouth activity to, exhibited by children, children are going to often reach right inside the glass, grab an ice cube, their hands will come in contact with the solution that's in there, which is the soft drink. They will then suck on the ice cube and their wet hands will come in contact with the glass. They can do this over and over again for a period of several many minutes or even a period of hours in the useful life of the glass. When they lick their fingers, the lead will come off. But it's not, it's not from contact lead on the liquid itself. That is not that is not what you said. It's Am not I... leaching into the liquid. It's not leaching into the liquid. Right. Okay. So that um, your argument is that there is some potential for that to happen uh, aside from the uh, fact that there was no contact between the liquid and the, and the uh, outside of the glass. A very definite potential. Have you tested that theory? Uh, the theory of, uh, of the lead coming off, yes, we have. With the 7-Up, we have uh, just used our test kit, left the uh, poured maybe 10 milliliters, a small amount, and let it dry on the glass for a period of uh, several minutes. And then we run some more into off of the glass into the, into the test, uh, our observation dish, and it's indicative of lead release. It's very easily demonstrated when, an, uh, when soda pop, our uh, acid like wine comes in contact with the outside of the glass, there will be a chemical reaction in which the lead will migrate from that defective paint into that soda pop or liquid. Would and you that lead is available at that time. Would you concede that the chances for lead poisoning in a glass like this that is decorated on the outside is far, far less than the potential for lead poisoning in those kinds of containers that you have before us? I would say yes, that would be true, unless uh, you look at all three types of glasses that have been, that industry has put on the market. As I mentioned earlier, the glasses coated with lead paint on the inside, then the Italian glasses that have the lip, uh, the rim of the glass coated with lead paint. Okay, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about these kinds of glasses that were, that were domestically made, not imported, uh, that have the decorations on the outside of the glass. They're, in our estimation, clearly, uh, clearly dangerous, potentially dangerous. Uh, the public should just be advised to either use them for decorative purposes or simply break them. To answer your earlier question, would you get poisoned by using that glass? Uh, we can prove clearly that 7-Up dissolves the outside paint on the outside of that just like sugar. It dissolves almost immediately in minutes with 7-Up. Well, I put the 7-Up uh, inside the glass. Okay, hold it. You're sitting there every night watching the, the evening news using your favorite, in your case, the lion's glass, was it? Okay. In that you have Coke, 7-Up, beer, whatever you would be drinking. You're also sitting there eating peanuts or pretzels or potato chips. They're salty. Now this is what many fellows have mentioned to me who do this. They say it's common when you're sitting there and eating and drinking, you're licking your fingers all the time and, and the glass is sweating, okay? This is standard. The ice cubes, your glass is sweating all the time. And you're eating peanuts, licking your fingers and holding the glass, so you're getting lead, yeah. This is their description to me of how they would use it, grown men like you. Well, would the gentleman yield for about 10 seconds? Sure. I'm just curious, what happens if this glass goes into a normal dishwasher? We will, have, will, the, will the dishwashing solvents uh, break down the lead on the outside and... and uh, we have a lion's glass that's, uh, uh, that's on exhibit here, which we uh, washed for about a month, month and a half. And we put a piece of laboratory tape right around the dead center of the glass. The end of that cycle time, we peeled off the tape. 
where the tape was, it's clear and, and, uh, and bright and, and glass-like, shiny. Uh, it's, uh, the finish is very dulled. I've done uh, scanning electron micrographs of looking at the degradation through dishwasher. The answer is yes, that the, uh, it is not uh, resistant to the abrasive alkaline uh, uh, activity and the abrasiveness of the water in high temperatures in a dishwasher. The, it, uh, the paint will deteriorate. Lead will then become, in our estimation, as easily available or, if not, more so available. Mr. Wall oh, you finished? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, are you familiar with the uh, tri-agency test method for lead? The tri-agency, tri is that the Food and Drug Administration, 4% 24-hour exposure? Right, right. Uh, yes, we've done probably 5,000 leaching tests using that method. And as I understand it, that, that method involves soaking uh, glassware upside down in a 4% acetic solution um, for 24 hours, is that right? That's correct. It's 4% it's acetic acid, which is weaker in actually than ordinary distilled white vinegar, which is 5% acetic acid. How does that compare to uh, orange juice, uh, milk, uh, grapefruit juice, colas, that kind of thing in, in acetic? Well, the pH of 4% uh, of acetic acid uh, is 2.7 or thereabouts, which shows that it is, uh, it's a weak acid. The pH of 7-up, for example, that we use to test the mobile glasses is 3.1. Um, I think that, this, uh, uh, that the test uh, leaves little margin of safety for the consumer. Uh, it's counter to good logic with my experiment. You don't agree with the test standards, you mean? I don't agree with the test standards. Are your standards much more stringent in your testing? Well, we make them more rigorous because uh, the standards only uh, that are tested in industry only test a brand new vessel uh, that's, that's been unused. We continue that further and maybe dishwash a vessel 40, 50, 100 times and then test it. In some cases, we discover much higher lead release comes out or non-existent lead release comes out because the glaze is dissolved partially by the dishwasher exposing the paint underneath. Well, that test that we referred to uh, does, in fact, uh, put the uh, container in question uh, under the acidic test for 24 straight hours, is that right? That's correct. And now, that is a much longer period than uh, if I, I, I sit in front of TV a lot watching sports, but I don't sit 24 straight hours licking my fingers and, and uh, drinking uh, out of lion's glasses. I mean, the point yeah, is, you don't need the, point is the, test, the test is, uh, it seems to me, a, rather, a relatively severe test. You're talking about a 4% acetic solution for 24 hours, um, much greater use than you would, have, than you would see in a normal uh, situation. Is that, isn't that, a case? Well, isn't that the Mr. case? Mr. Oxley, the, uh, in those tests, I've just uh, been led to understand that the, the, the voluntary standard was exceeded by something like four or five times. So something like 300 uh, parts per million came out in that test. The vessels, whether uh, these glasses, whether tested by the industry standard themselves or our abbreviated standard using 7-Up, they clearly leach uh, high levels of lead, violative levels of lead under the uh, voluntary standard. But the problem is that uh, the public has uh, the manufacturer nor the distributor aren't interested in even advising the public that they can present a hazard, especially to young children. Well, as I understand it, the industry has done extensive testing uh, using the, the uh, standards that we talked about and that uh, there is no evidence that I'm aware of that there have been uh, uh, any violations of that uh, standard. Is that, can you, can you cite a specific case where in, in this kind of situation or others where there was an actual violation of, of current standards or that it put the public uh, in any uh, danger whatsoever? I would have to acquiesce to the Food and Drug Administration itself or well, be to testifying. the council to answer that. I do not, I'm not privy to their actual testing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just see if I can wrap up this glass situation for uh, a moment. We've got the Detroit... Uh, Detroit Lions glass and uh, the 
uh, subcommittee asked the Food and Drug Administration to test this glass specifically. And on June 20th, we got the results from Edward Steele of the FDA Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Now, what Mr. Steele said specifically is that this glass, the Detroit Lions glass, contains 323 parts of lead per million. Now, the voluntary standard, which as I said earlier from uh, Mr. Lake's opinion, who's the director of the Office of Compliance, Mr. Lake feels the standard at 50 parts per million is too weak, and the results that we just got from the Food and Drug Administration indicates that this glass has 323 parts per million, six times the acceptable Food and Drug Administration uh, level. The gentleman yield on it, that. Just one moment. And, uh, I just want to make sure that we also uh, make clear the point with respect to kids, because I have a four-year-old, and I watch him, and have in particular over the last few weeks since this issue has come up. Now, for kids, their mouth comes in contact with the lip and the rim of these glasses. I mean, that's just a fact. Young kids are all over them. And frankly, a lot of kids go further than the lip and the rim of the glass. They lick those glasses and are attracted by this ornamentation. Now, the relevant issue, it seems to me, is why in the world would we want kids to be getting more lead than they need to be getting? That's what's really outrageous about all this. In our conversations with industry, they don't need to do this. They don't need to expose the kids to this kind of lead. And I think that's the issue that we're really going to be, be concerned about. This glass has six times the amount, according to the Food and Drug Administration, that's the voluntary standard. My feeling is the FDA is right when they say the voluntary standard is way too weak. But the bottom line is really something else, and that is why in the world would we want to be subjecting these kids to this kind of exposure? And the most recent toxicological evidence what really concerns me, the most recent evidence indicates that for kids, even at a very low level of exposure, there can be significant health concerns. So you all have been uh, helpful, and I'll have some questions in a moment, but I'd like to yield to my colleague from Ohio. Thank you. Just to point out again that there's a significant difference between those types of containers we have in front of us that, are, that have the glazing inside the glass and the type of uh, glass that are domestically produced that have the glazing on the outside. And there's a huge, huge difference uh, in the kind of applications that each one of them have and in terms of their overall danger. And I just think that's important to point out for the record. Well, I'm going to move on, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, but I, I think you all have made the case very well there's no reason in the world why kids should be exposed to this kind of lead. And when you talk about uh, a, a glass that's six times in excess of the voluntary standard, I think we've got something that needs to be turned around. Now, you all, as I understand it, had some discussions with representatives of both Mobile and uh, Libby Glass about the need to alert consumers uh, to this uh, health issue. What was their response when you, uh, you talked with them? I spoke to the representative, uh, Ms. Carol Edwards, of Mobile, and uh, she at first informed me that their, the glasses were safe. We then had the test performed using 7-Up, and I sent her the test results. And again, the conclusion was the glass was safe. I heard on the news this morning that a representative from Libby stated there is no hazard. We simply disagree with all of those. A couple of other questions, if I might. In uh, correspondence with the subcommittee, the Food and Drug Administration indicated that the agency was seriously considering a proposal to reduce its action levels for large hollowware to 0.1 parts per million. But most recently, the FDA has indicated that they plan to defer action on other types of ceramic ware, such as small hollow ware, until they gauge the reaction to the large hollow ware proposal. Do you all believe that the agency needs to lower the action levels for small hollow ware and flat ware, as well as the large hollow ware? I gather that this could have some direct impact on the Pier 1 pitcher example. Uh, 
Yes, uh, to take those questions, number one, uh, all action levels for lead, leachable lead, of, uh, the FDA has tentatively concluded that all should be reduced. The one that they're reducing is already the lowest one. Uh, it's two and a half parts per million for large hollow wear. Uh, I, may or, I may not have the exact two Pier 1 pictures because we bought so many of them, but as a representative example, the cutoff point that differentiates, differentiates small hollow wear from large hollow wear is 1.1 liters. If it's 1.1 liter or greater, it's large hollow wear. If it's less than 1.1 liter, it's small hollow wear. The blue pitcher, and there's only one that's directly in front of me, we purchased at Pier 1. It happened to hold 1,090 milliliters. It therefore fell into the category of small hollow wear. Uh, the yellow one, I believe, was about 1,250 milliliters. It's large hollow wear. Lead release at a level of five parts per million for the small hollow wear is just uh, is, is too great. One other example is the brown and top and tanned coffee mug that was purchased at Sears and Robux and sent to us by a woman in Roswell, New Mexico. It's towards me from the uh, from the orange uh, Fiesta wear picture that's there. That particular vessel was leached by a independent testing laboratory at 4.0 parts per million of lead. Uh, it's a coffee cup available and bought at a Dollarama sale. There's no marking whatsoever where it comes from, and it leached 80 percent of the FDA's maximum allowable standard for that. The answer is all, uh, all levels should be dropped as soon as possible. I don't have any further questions, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace. I just want to commend you uh, for speaking out. It's my view that we don't have to have these kind of lead exposures. I mean, if there's decent, proper quality control with respect to uh, these glasswares and these ceramic wares, we won't have this kind of exposure. And I think that's what uh, is really important. In, we're going to hear from uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, in a few moments about how they're going to beef up their standards and really protect the public. Uh, I think uh, unless my colleagues have anything further, you all would like, like, uh, gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wallace, your exposure to lead came from mugs, I believe, that you and your wife purchased as individuals in Italy. Is that correct? That's correct. I was with uh, duty with NATO in southern Italy, and we bought those uh, in southern Italy. The FDA, <clears throat> in testimony they'll give today, uh, described this type of purchase uh, as opposed to commercial imports as beyond its control. What suggestions do you have for this subcommittee uh, for protecting the tourist or the U.S. serviceman abroad from unsafe pottery? I think uh, education, uh, Fran and I have talked about this at length, education in many cases, particularly within the government from agency to agency, is extremely cheap. It consists sometimes of a letter. If the Food and Drug Administration Center for Food Safety Applied Nutrition were to send a letter to the Department of Defense, to the medical uh, authorities there, to the Department of State, alerting them to this problem, and uh, also I should mention that uh, when we were in Italy, we liaised directly with the American Embassy in Rome. We liaised with the commercial attaché in Rome in February, we, in February of this year. And we provided them with the, uh, our test kits, 20, 30, 40, whatever we could bring over there. Uh, we, are, we are liaising with medical authorities, medical doctor and naval station in Italy. We have provided them with our information. They're doing screening. Uh, it's, it's of utmost importance that, that when knowledge as such as happened to myself and my wife uh, uh, becomes known, preventative actions can be taken, but sometimes it's difficult. I have personally contacted the office of the United States Air Force Inspector General on numerous occasions over the last seven years and have yet to have a reply. Uh, we don't have the power to do this. 
uh, we're private citizens. We try, but sometimes we just can't get heard that there's, that there's a problem. We're finding other service people that have brought back very dangerous items. Some are on display there. Education and notification is what's needed. How significant do you think this problem is of the casual purchase by tourists, by uh, Defense Department personnel, state personnel, other, other uh, government personnel? overseas as as compared to the problem of commercial imports but the commercial imports have some modicum of control albeit the uh, food and drug probably couldn't even uh, inspect one one thousandth of one percent the problem in our estimation in isolated cases is probably uh, has probably resulted in fatalities but in other cases I must reiterate that I was a uh, 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 a flying officer in the United States Air Force. I flew fighter bombers and reconnaissance. I was undergoing, uh, undergoing uh, rigorous flight physical examinations at the same time that I was being systemically poisoned by lead. I went through a variety and myriad of symptoms and yet none of the doctors could diagnose it. Our, we feel that there is a significant hazard that's presented not only to tourists but by, by people that send things from overseas. They're, when we were in Italy, we found out that Italy does have a standard for lead release. It's similar to the Food and Drug Administration standard. But what knocked us over, really we expected it, but it did knock us over to see in reality. We were able to purchase items in the finest uh, shops in Rome, use our little test kit. Four out of the first 11 were violative, highly violative, and something six or seven out of the next 13. This was, happened in February. We're talking high lead release, sometimes in the hundreds of parts per million from functional dinnerware. And it's being purchased by not only visitors, but uh, the embassy and, and such over there. The problem is very significant. It just needs to be investigated. We're going to hear testimony today from uh, some importers regarding compliance uh, and the measures that they take to ensure that the pottery they import meets U.S. standards. Obviously, from what you've said, uh, they apparently are not doing enough. What, what do you think they can do to uh, improve the situation? Well, I think we have to go to the source, to the manufacturer uh, itself, wherever it is. And that uh, quality control has to be tightened up. As you'll see in the, our written testimony, there, is a, um, there are letters in there from uh, ceramic engineers that say that the problem of lead has always been a sticky problem because of the ever-present danger of lead release. If you combine this with the fact that, that uh, we call it kiln mates, things that have been fired in the same kiln, say in the same run, that a wide variation of lead release can, uh, can happen if it's done in a, in a primitive kiln rather than, say, a commercial kiln. You also have random sampling, and that's all that is conducted. Also, the cost of sampling we found in Italy, for example, was $70 per item to determine lead release using atomic absorption spectrophotometry. In the United States, it's $25 to $50. We've had one distributor here that has actually used our little home lead test kit to screen items that they intend to import. And if the test kit shows any sort of positive at all, then those items will be subsequently checked by an analytical testing laboratory. I believe that he, uh, in conversations, he said that we have saved him many, many, many thousands of dollars for a very purchase of just 150 or $200, however, however many kits that he bought. Well, don't you think we have to rely uh, or perhaps force the importers to do this testing because we can't reach the manufacturers in foreign countries in many cases. One of the most important uh, you know, items that Fran and I had came across here and, and are proud of is the recent memorandum of understanding that exists between the People's Republic and China and the United States. The MOU, as they call it, is a good way, provided that the Food and Drug Administration, if they're going to run this program, is funded so that they can go out like the Food and, and, ag, uh, and Agriculture Organization and actually inspect on site. Uh, we view the United States as kind of outside of the ballpark. It's a home run if you can get something into this country. 
in other words it's difficult to identify and recall when we're talking five hundred million pieces per year if the food and drug administration could work and make a memorandum of understanding say with italy in in particular we and we passed out some newspaper articles where our efforts here in the united states i'm talking about Fran and myself as a couple have actually impacted on the ceramic industry of Italy. We're quite happy that it has because it means that we have prevented these items from coming into this country. But those items certainly are still being produced and I believe and Fran believes, I'm sure, that they're dumped on some other country that does not have the lead release laws. So the idea of an organization such as the Food and Drug Administration, liaising with the World Health Organization to develop a memorandum of understanding, provided that its inspectors, its authorities, can have the per diem money to go out in the field. And we're only talking a few thousand dollars. I think it's one of the most excellent ideas that could be uh, presented. Thank you. Thank our thank colleague. You, Time, gentlemen's expired. Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, we thank you for excellent testimony and for your particular uh, courage. Unless you have anything further you'd like to add, we'll excuse you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. Our next uh, panel, the Honorable Frank Young, MD, Commissioner, Food and Drug Administration, accompanied by Richard J. Runk, uh, Acting Director, Senator for, for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, L. Robert Lake, Esquire Director, Office of, of Compliance, Edward A. Steele, Mr. Thomas Scarlett, W. Gary Flam, Ph.D., and also Catherine R. Mahaffey, Ph.D., Office of the Director, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. If all of you will come forward. Is that table long enough for you there? Yes. Tom, would you like to come over here? Let me welcome all our uh, witnesses. I think, Dr. Young, you're aware that it's the practice of our subcommittee to swear our, all our witnesses. Perhaps some of the others aren't. Do any of you at the table have any objection to being sworn as witnesses today? Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth up you got? I do. Let me also advise uh, our guests of uh, their right to uh, counsel throughout uh, their appearance uh, today. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with uh, Dr. Young and uh, Dr. Mah Mahaffey. Uh, do you, Dr. Young, or do you, Ms. Mahaffey, desire to have counsel today? Yeah. All right. Let me also uh, note uh, that there is a copy of the rules of the subcommittee to have with you throughout your appearance today. We will make a copy of your prepared remarks a part of the uh, record uh, in their entirety. Let me welcome you, uh, Dr. Young, uh, particularly to welcome you. And I also want to take particular pleasure that your son is here today and because of his uh, remarkable accomplishments, we're very glad that he could be with us as well. So we will make a copy of your remarks a part of the record and if you would like to summarize your key concerns, that'd be very helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to focus my remarks in the following way. First, I'd like to talk to some of the medical issues that uh, affect us with lead poisoning. I would like to pick up some of the issues that were raised by Mr. and Mrs. Wallace. I would like to also give a perspective of where lead of, is in the uh, general regulation and control of lead, and then I specifically want to focus in on the issue of today, the concerns of pottery. I would like to start off 
by saying there is no medical good that comes from lead intake into the body. It is also a disease, lead poisoning, that is one that can be preventable, but the involvement of individuals with lead is complicated because lead is used so widely uh, in the environment. There have been major decreases in lead that we have seen over the period of time, first in the reduction of lead in the environment through the reduction of lead in gasoline. That has made a major decrease. Secondly, there has been a reduction in the level that has been present in food, and we can document that, and I'll show you a few uh, slides to indicate that. This is a, a, mask, a market basket survey for lead in foods, and it extends from the years 1980 to 1984. And as you can see, there is a marked decrease, approximately an 85% reduction of foods uh, containing lead. This is primarily due to the marked change that has occurred in the reduction of lead soda and the use, particularly importantly for the case of infants, of lead-free containers by using glass for baby foods, as was in the case with your uh, uh, child. If I could have the next graph, please. One can see that, that this type of, of uh, decrease is now clear by the decrease in lead solder, as you can see, the red line going down, and then you can see the marked increase in welded uh, cans and other products. This has resulted in a significant decrease in lead that is available in our regular food products. If I could have the next one, please, Phil. One can see, if one looks at infant food, the most susceptible population that we must uh, help, that there is a marked decrease in the juices, again by the use of different types of containers from the early 70s to where we are today, a decrease in the uh, infant formula and also a decrease in other foods. I believe this has been the first priority of the Food and Drug Administration traditionally to decrease this from uh, food products per se. As we now focus on the pottery issue, I believe there is a substantial concern. The problem though, as Mr. Wallace uh, said and I will try to paint for you, is one of great complexity. Uh, we have initiated a variety of regulations. Year by year, there has been a reduction in the amount of lead that is able to be used in this large uh, hollowware. However, we are dealing not only with manufacturers of large amounts of hollowware, but also some that have been done by and large by a cottage industry. I have from a state contract a uh, picture of one which was just sent in uh, recently uh, of a large hollowware baking dish that not only uh, contained lead but contained 6,160 parts per million. That's a large amount and in this sense it is focused on not only the outside which we were addressing earlier than the mouthing and fingering but really this is present within the uh, dinnerware itself. We were very pleased to see the type of interaction that uh, the Wallaces have done and I really applaud this type of citizen concern. I think it's very important and in fact this year uh, I presented and had great pleasure in presenting the Wallaces with a commissioner citation for the type of work that was done and I wish that more individuals were vigilant in protecting their own health. I think in relation to the question that was made by, raised by Mr. Belly and in part uh, by uh, you and Mr. Oxley, there is a need for consumer protection on the part of the consumer. And thus, uh, HES kits such as the one developed by Mr. Wallace, the one that I can demonstrate for you that the Food and Drug Administration has used to rapidly screen uh, pottery at low cost are important advances. We should not only rely on the federal government to protect here. It is extremely important that each individual citizen understands the risk. I concur that educational efforts are very, very important. We have uh, focused on this over the years and will heighten it. 
The final point that I would like to focus on is if I could have the next uh, block is to uh, show on this particular graph that, uh, could you go right by that one, I've uh, used that uh, conceptually, to show that there is a decrease in the Haynes II study of the lead levels that we see in uh, individuals over this period of time. You can see starting in 1976 that the lead level in uh, uh, micrograms per deciliter was up around 16. It's now at least a, a bit below 11 to 12. This is only 1980. We haven't gotten the data since then. We anticipate that that graph will show further decreases. The program is working, but the epistatic poisoning that can occur from large hollow wear and other places are a problem to us. Finally, we have uh, been active in looking at imports. We have developed a number of memorandum of understanding with countries, the most recent of which is uh, China, and we are exploring and have received initial contact back from the country of Italy, and we would look forward to developing a memorandum of understanding there. We are also working with Mexico. Nevertheless, despite these, if tourists pick up a piece of hollow glassware, I'm sorry, a pottery, a piece of uh, uh, pottery that may be a cup or other drinking uh, utensil, one is at risk and therefore there needs to be a rapid test and we believe there are some on the market and I would urge consumers to be very careful. <coughs> Ironically, some of these hollow glasswares are very expensive and the expense is not only borne in the pottery itself, but the expense is borne in the body load that occur from lead. I thank you for letting me put my entire testimony in the record, but I wanted to highlight these points for your consideration, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Young, thank you, and we'll have some questions in a moment. Dr. Mahaffey, let's get that uh, microphone over to you, and oh, uh, you. if you could speak into it, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much, Ken. Can I be heard? Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Catherine Mahaffey. I am presently a staff scientist with the Office of the Director, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I was invited to testify today because of my experience and expertise in lead toxicity. My training includes a doctorate in biochemistry and graduate training in epidemiology. I have approximately 20 years of research experience in the area of lead toxicity and the adverse effects of lead on human health. In 1972, I joined the United States Food and Drug Administration in the Division of Toxicology. My primary responsibility with food and drug was to evaluate the health significance of typical levels of lead exposure. In 1973, I became the manager of Food and Drug Administration's Lead Contamination of Foods pro Project, and I acted in this capacity until I left the agency in 1983. During this time, I conducted research on the adverse effects of lead and on a using a variety of approaches, uh, both laboratory, epidemiological, and clinical studies. At the request of the director of the Bureau of Foods, in 1977, I evaluated the information on health effects of lead for infants and children and established um, what we then regarded as tolerable level of lead intake for infants and young children. This has been published and appears in the journal Pediatrics and was submitted for the record. In this evaluation, I recommended that a maximal level of lead intake from all sources, and this would include from dust, from paint, from water, from food, and release of lead in, from ceramic dinnerware, that the maximum not exceed 100 micrograms per day for infants and for children between ages six months and two years that the maximum level not exceed 150 micrograms per day. And it's critical to recognize that these are rec maximal intakes from all sources. One thing to note about lead is that it is a cumulative toxin, and so it's not the amount ingested each day 
but the amount ingested over time that becomes very important. <laughs> Medical investigators have known for a number of years that lead affects the central nervous system, the hematopoietic or the blood forming system, and the kidney. In young children, the effects of lead are on the nervous system, and these are of greatest concern. This is because the nervous system is now recognized to be the most vulnerable area in the infant and young child. In the mid-1970s, when the numbers 100 and 150 micrograms per day were developed, the hematopoietic system, the blood-forming system, rather than the nervous system, was considered to be the target organ first affected. Over the last 10 to 15 years, there have been a number of studies that have further demonstrated the effect of lead on the nervous system of children. One of the most important came in 1979 in which a medical report that was published in New England Journal of Medicine by, New by Needleman et al. indicated that there were neural behavioral effects of children from middle class families and that these children had exposures to lead at what were considered to be typical or normal levels for urban children. The research reported by Needleman et al. showed a general tendency for children who had higher body burdens of lead to perform less well on tests of learning, behavior, and of intelligence. Because of the significance of this 1979 report, there was a period of deliberation within the medical, scientific, and public health communities, both nationally and internationally. During the decade of the 1980s, we have seen that a number of longitudinal epidemiology studies have shown that typical levels of lead exposure affected both intelligence, neurobehavioral function, and learning ability of children. The results of this research have been evaluated over the last two or three years, and a summary of these reports, which is by Davis and Svengard, 1978, has been submitted for the record. The consensus now is that levels of lead present in the general population are associated with subtle neural behavioral impairment in learning ability of children. When the recommended tolerable levels of lead intake of 100 and 150 micrograms per day were proposed, Lead toxicity was thought to begin when the blood lead exceeded 30 micrograms per deciliter and when hematological changes were considered the target organ first affected. Because of the results of these long-term epidemiological studies, the provisional evaluation now is that lead toxicity is thought to begin when the blood lead level exceeds uh, 10 micrograms per deciliter and the nervous system is considered the target organ first affected. The extent to which these numbers of 100 and 150 micrograms should be lowered is not entirely clear at this time. Relatively little is known about the relationship of blood lead and environmental lead at these low levels of lead intake. However, what is known suggests that there's a rapid increase in blood lead with relatively low levels of exposure. In terms of the history of the food and drug efforts to control lead release, Dr. Young has, has spoken to this. One of my current activities is writing a criteria document for the World Health Organization concerning tolerable levels of lead exposure for infants and children. And initially, I felt that this document should be limited to evaluation of women during pregnancy, infants, and very young children. It's become clear over time, though, that it's not possible to isolate a specific population a group when considering the effects of lead. Therefore, recommendations should be aimed at protecting the most vulnerable segment of the general population. And in this case, it's uh, women, infants, and very young children. And a second observation is that internationally, excessive levels of lead exposure remain a problem for a number of countries. 
Reports from a variety of sources indicate that the problem of release of lead from ceramic dinnerware is a worldwide problem. Restrictions on the release of lead from ceramic dinnerware can benefit both persons in the country where the dinnerware is produced as well as citizens of the United States. The tolerable levels of lead intake will need to be reevaluated to bring these up to date with recent health information. We recognize that blood levels considered acceptable for public health have declined markedly in the past 10 to 15 years with improved understanding of the range of effects on health that lead produces. The release of lead from ceramic dinnerware requires chemical analysis after extraction using the mild acids. Because of the time of analysis required, it's my view that the international agreements and standards such as those used for foods um, under the Food Codex or the Codex Alimentarius are needed. Tolerable levels of lead intake from dinnerware developed under such agreements and standards need to be consistent with the most recent health information. I will be pleased to answer any question you or the members may have. Thank Dr. You. Mahaffey, thank you very much. Gentleman from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I could, I'd like to uh, draw the committee's attention to Exhibit 8 and also the panelists. Well, the staff is, is uh, bringing this exhibit forward. Let me just say that this exhibit, which is based on FDA data, shows that imports of ceramic ware in 1985 totaled $509 million and accounted for nearly 44,000 customs entries. Meanwhile, in fiscal year 1985, FDA tested a total of only 95 import samples for lead and cadmium release. The agency's testing activities increased to 811 import samples in fiscal year 1987, but this level still represents a small fraction of the ceramic imported into the United States. And I would further observe uh, that the number of samples found to be in violation of standards ranged from somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 percent of the number sampled to about 25 percent over the last five years. Uh, I'm just curious, Dr. Young and Mr. Ronk, uh, given this level of testing, isn't the FDA relying primarily on the quality assurance procedures of industry to assure safe imports of, of ceramic ware? Mr. Slattery, we have a major problem in focusing on all of imports. And you see the upswing in the samples that are analyzed primarily due to the agency's concern with imports beginning in our action plan where we documented this in around 1985 through 86. The problem that we face is really one of competing resources. But right now, you saw me just a short time ago double the inspection of the blood banks in the United States to be sure that our blood supply is as safe as humanly possible. When we're trying to balance a variety of, of concerns, one of my biggest frustrations is that even our friends in Congress consider decreasing the budget. Uh, just right now, there is in both the House and the Senate a recommendation for a 1 to 2 percent reduction in the current budget. It's just not fair to ask for more inspections and at the same time decrease the budget. We have to be given clear signals. If you'd like more inspections, please go along with a program that I raised earlier. On the other hand, if we're doing too many inspections, please send the same commitment uh, both in oversight and in budget uh, allotments. Okay. Well, Dr. Young, let me just follow up your last comment. As a member of the Budget Committee, I, I assume that uh, you have made your request known to the administration through the last few years. And uh, the administration, you might share with us their response to your request. Have they trimmed back to your request, or have they granted your request, or uh, what has we been We have your had the same even-handed treatment on both Congress and administration. It's not very generous, <laughs> to be very is that what serious. you're saying? On very side. seriously, uh, I've been pleased in the last few years to have brought forward concerns in aids which have been fully funded and concerns in some of the import programs which have been increased. 
but we have on both sides uh, had some decreases and I've been struggling and the agency has been struggling to meet our public health needs and it is of concern when we already have a budget brought forward to at the very last minute uh, see those reductions as well. I'm not whining, I'm not trying to be quarrelsome, but I just ask for please send me the, uh, the same signal in both oversight and budget. I think it's safe to, to uh, conclude from some of your remarks and your testimony that, that for us to even achieve strong corporate uh, quality assurance programs, it will necessitate really more resources on the part of the FDA to, to monitor these corporate uh, assurance programs. Is that what you're telling Absolutely. me? Absolutely. Okay. All the memorandum of understanding must be back assay. Mm -hmm. All of the corporate voluntary agreements must be back assayed. I must say we dropped the ball between 77 and uh, the present time in the analysis of, of the, uh, the uh, glassware, Mr. Oxley's uh, famous or infamous uh, glass of the uh, Detroit uh, Lions. Uh, fortunately for the Redskins they didn't do as well as they, they could have otherwise. But that's a, a very low risk as compared to some of these real major risks on earth and uh, where that we're trying to focus on. That's why we went with the MOUs and the okay. education program. Well, I would observe that one promising approach the agency has initiated in this area is the development of its first memorandum of understanding with uh, the People's Republic of China earlier this year, and I commend yes, you for sir. that. But uh, let's turn our attention to the countries other than uh, the People's Republic of China and evaluate the nature of the incentives provided to industry to assure the safety of their ceramic uh, ware imports. According to data provided by your agency, 128 samples of imported ceramic ware analyzed for the agency in fiscal year 87 exceeded FDA's guidelines for lead release. Now 115 of the 128 of these samples came from countries outside the People's Republic of China. And I'm just curious, has, has the agency initiated any criminal uh, uh, prosecutions against any of the parties involved in these 115 violations? No, we have not initiated any uh, criminal prosecutions. It's very difficult to... Has the agency to... imposed any kind of monetary penalties against the firms involved? We can seize the uh, materials that are in violation and those can be destroyed. Now, ha has the agency done that? Uh, let me uh, turn to Mr. Lake to give a more detailed analysis of the, uh, the detentions and uh, what has gone on. Well, actually, on the uh, imports, what we do is, is detain them. So, uh, and w when we catch them at the border, now those that get in, basically, we have been handling through recalls. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have not, uh, we have not done any pro pro uh, prosecutions, nor are any pending at this time. Okay, and let me just make sure I understand the procedure mm -hmm. that you use. So there, the, the, there is no criminal prosecution involved. There is no monetary penalties imposed. Uh, and what actually do you do then, uh, Mr. Lake, when uh, you, s you determine that uh, uh, a shipment is in violation of standards? Okay, if it, if we, again, if we catch it at the border, we simply detain it. We don't let it in. Okay. Um, following the detections of these 115 violations, uh, did the FDA require all of the involved uh, importers to test subsequent shipments for excessive lead release for a period of time? Or did you just say... We caught you this time and carry on, or what, how did you deal with that? No, the, the focus really is on the goods themselves, and, and uh, uh, under the, the provisions of the Act that relate to imports, if we find repeated violations uh, from the same manufacturer company, we will then institute automatic detention in which we then, without sampling at all, will simply detain everything that comes in automatically and put the burden back then on the importer to prove that they indeed meet the uh, meet the standard, or in the case of uh, the Chinese, as as this created a problem for them, uh, you know they they uh, decided that uh, they should negotiate with us for an MOU, uh, which again uh, has the effect of having them do the quality control, forces them really to do the quality control before they even export to this country. Mm -hmm. We think that really is the most. Uh, appropriate and prudent use of resources because we can put that burden there. We would like to negotiate others, but you're absolutely correct, Ms. Slattery. The fact that we catch uh, such a uh, low number, it's almost like the cost of doing business, which is our original thrust on increasing the total import program. Well, 
isn't it true, Mr. Lake, that uh, in most cases the only cost imposed on a company for selling dangerous ceramic ware in this country uh, are the revenues lost because of destruction of the violative uh, goods? That and the that true? Uh, yeah, well, that and the adverse publicity that may surround recall. And, and isn't it also true, Mr. Lake, that that penalty is even further reduced and weakened by the fact that uh, in some cases the FDA allows the firm to relabel the items that are determined to be in violation of the standards and they're merely required to, to put a label that says not for food use and resell it as decorative wear. Isn't that, that true? That's correct. Well, Dr. Young, given this situation, aren't you concerned that many firms may fail to institute meaningful quality assurance programs necessary to prevent the marketing of, of this dangerous ceramic ware because they feel that the likelihood of detection is small? Isn't that Absolutely, really yes. This is a reason that I've done two things. First, we've, uh, through the uh, development of the Office of Regulatory Affairs, are, are working with and communicating our actions and our great concern uh, to industry. Second, we are increasing the amount of uh, inspections that are being undertaken and as part of that we will develop memorandum of understanding as widely as we can and we hope that we'll have one soon with uh, Italy and some of the other countries that we've had uh, problems with. Mm -hmm. The memorandum of understanding we feel is the uh, best way to, to handle this at this time. We also feel that we must increase our educational programs and we shall be doing that to try to help the citizens of the United States realize that there is a problem. I think that there is not a wide enough understanding. As I said earlier as a physician, I don't see any redeeming value of lead medically. Sure. Well, as members of the subcommittee, we, we share your concern, and that's one of the reasons why we're involved in this hearing today, is to focus some attention on, on this problem and hopefully encourage business, government, regulators, and, and consumers to, to focus more attention on it also. I appreciate that and I think the publicity that we'll get from this hearing will be a very positive event. Let me just uh, comment further that as part of this investigation the subcommittee undertook an extensive review of the quality assurance uh, procedures of Pier 1 imports and uh, we undertook this inquiry because Pier 1 had been involved in four recalls of ceramic ware during the last five years and that was the highest number of recalls experienced by any firm during this period. And based on its review, the subcommittee determined that uh, Pier 1 Imports, a major importer of ceramic ware, had absolutely no test testing program to assure compliance with FDA's lead and cadmium release guidelines until late 1987. And the company experienced its third major recall. Prior to this time, the company relied solely on the experience of its buyers to assure quality control. Moreover, recent subcommittee interviews with ceramic ware importers and FDA officials have confirmed that many importers and retailers, particularly smaller operations, continue to market ceramic ware without any meaningful quality assurance programs. I mean, that's basically the situation as we see it at this time. Do you have any comment on that? I think that there is a definite problem on the part of industry. I mentioned once before to this committee, it's almost an irony that the Food and Drug Administration, like the Wallaces, have to go out and shop for the ceramic ware only in the case that we find it to be in violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act do we get our money back. Otherwise, we have to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars buying this ceramic ware to test that it's in violation. We too, like Mrs. Wallace tried to develop the best eyes so that we can see it and reduce our expenditures. We would uh, think that that's a, a poor practice in general that we have to go and deal with that because there is no quality assurance program and we are working on seeing what our options might be to develop a tighter quality assurance program across the nation. Well, I appreciate that and, and uh, from your comments, I mean, it's clear that you share our concern about this and I'm just wondering, can the and will the agency commit to develop memorandums of understanding like the MOU that you have already developed uh, with the PRC with other countries such as Italy and Hong Kong and Taiwan which have a history of consistently high violation rates? You can uh, rely on us to do our utmost to develop these. I was pleased to uh, personally have signed off the one with the People's Republic of China. We do have a letter back from uh, uh, the Italian government which I can introduce for the record for you that shows their interest. 
That's the one we're working on right now. Could I have a, uh, I, let me just read that for you. It's very brief. Okay. And it's in response to one of our letters uh, to them. It's uh, dated as May 1988. Dear Mr. Hardy, thank you for your letter of May 12th concerning ceramic foodware exported to the United States from Italy. We wish to ensure you that we've sent a copy of your letter to the uh, competent Italian authorities for action and follow-up on this matter. And you. we look forward to working with them on that, and I'll submit that for the record for you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ronk and Dr. Young, I'm just curious. Do you think we're to the point where we should recommend the extension to FDA a foreign plant inspection authority, uh, such as available to the Department of Agriculture in the meat inspection area, to enhance the agency's efforts to really monitor this problem? Is it that serious? Or are we to the point where we should be looking at doing something like that? That's a close judgment call, and I'll ask Mr. Ronk to add his to mine as well as Mr. Lake. I would say this. Uh, we do have, in the case of drugs, the ability to do foreign inspections on good manufacturing practices. We have more recently gone the route of trying to get memorandums of understanding and agreement where we mutually inspect plants on our soil and document them for the other nation and conversely. Uh, we have one such agreement with Switzerland. To do that, it does mean that we have to do foreign inspections periodically to focus on the quality, the ongoing quality of that memorandum of understanding and agreement. And we also need to deal with other nations uh, that are not able to comply or not complying now. The question comes in as a cost-benefit analysis as to the large numbers of dollars that would be expended. At the moment, I would prefer to see the memorandum of understanding and agreement and back assaying these. This will require some more attention to the foreign inspections and of course with it the concomitant uh, resources to do it. Dick, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, thank you, Chairman. We have several programs in mind. Uh, in general, we are working on programs that try and have the brokers, import brokers, take more responsibility, more quality assurance mm -hmm. uh, responsibility for their products. This uh, we're trying, going to try to do in the pesticide area. We're trying to do this with spices. We've had meetings with them about what it relates to other kinds of defects. Mm -hmm. I think that clearly the, the, uh, the broker sector of imports needs to be more responsible for quality assurance as the domestic manufacturer is. And I noticed that some of the the attachments to the uh, that you, that you have uh, from some firms such as Sears and others, uh, J C Penney, I, I see that they have quality assurance programs that they relate to products that they're importing. But that needs to be generally done for importers of products in general. Mm -hmm. Second, there are in fact organizations for this particular problem uh, with the Meat and Poultry Inspection Service. Of course, you're talking about high risk food product. There are some high risk food products that FDA FDA has that lend themselves to to inspection. Uh, this is more of a sampling program, as you can see. If, if we went and inspected a ceramic plant, unless we are there on the day that the kiln is not operating properly, we would not observe anything on toward. What we, we do think is that memorandums of understanding would be effective, and there are groups such as underwriter laboratories that carry out programs in foreign countries that could have those. Uh, Mr. Ronk, I'm, I have been advised that, that recently you stated to a member of the subcommittee staff that you believe that the FDA should be given this plant inspection authority similar to what the USDA has to help you monitor and enforce the uh, various memorandum of understanding. Is that, is that your opinion, uh, Mr. As Ronk? appropriate, for instance, I was saying for high-risk products, if we're talking about a fish inspection or we're talking about food inspection uh, directly, I, I would see that this uh, the inspection part of this will not be just as useful as it would be in those other areas. So but that's the, exactly that the that point that I was trying to make as well, that you need this to validate me me memorandums need. of understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think we're at the point, just one last question, where we really need to, to toughen your enforcement capability with respect to, to U.S. business concerns who continue to import dangerous products and um, are not, in fact, really 
putting in place the kind of self-enforcing programs that, that historically we have relied upon and many just have not provided. I've been a long advocate of strengthening the focus on, on imports. We must have a level playing field. During the last decade and a half, we've increased the number of imports, and we've not been able to focus enough on this. If we can only ask, say, 3 to 4 percent, cost of business is really trying to sneak it in. The American market is looked at as a golden apple around the world. I have no problems with things coming into the country at all on importation. Appropriate must meet our single standards. Okay. Mr. Commissioner, it seems clear that it is time for a thorough review of FDA's inspection and enforcement strategies in not only the ceramic air area, but in the entire food safety program, particularly in this area of skyrocketing imports and tight budget restraints. It seems essential to structure our enforcement programs to provide strong incentives for industry to police itself and stiff penalties for noncompliance, and I think that's I concur. We'll saying. send you the action plan phase two that'll show you that and the uh, one that we're working on for phase three. I look forward to working Chair, with you. Chair, thanks the gentleman for his excellent questions. Gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Young, uh, I know that in 80, 1987, uh, FDA did a survey uh, where they were looking at uh, various uh, problems in lead and ceramic ware, and uh, of the particularly in the foreign uh, imported pieces, 173 were tested and 15 were found in violation. <clears throat> I was particularly interested in the uh, wide variance of the uh, parts per million of uh, lead. Um, the lead level for the larger pieces uh, varied from 2.7 parts per million, uh, which is just over your standard of 2.5 uh, parts per million, to as high as 185 parts per million several of the pieces tested at many times that standard. Uh, is it unusual to have pieces so far out of compliance, or was that uh, perhaps a, uh, an aberration in the testing? No, I will submit for the record some graphs of this uh, uh, document, yes, thank you, that uh, will show uh, the variety of, of uh, changes. You can see, if, I apologize, I didn't make a graph up, up uh, here. Uh, for this, but there is 78.2 percent of these are between 0 and uh, 0.9. Uh, then the rest of these move out, 28 percent are, I'm sorry, 5.8 percent are between 1 and 1.9, and then there's a tail off, and these are the uh, lines above 0. And I'll those, submit this for the record. For those you. are the imported pieces? Uh, these are the cumulative uh, okay. samples that we have. So that's not broken down into uh, important. No, but we can break that down for you. The bulk of them. That concludes our coverage of this hearing on lead levels and housewares before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight. We leave now to bring you our regularly scheduled live coverage of the House of Representatives. You're watching C-SPAN, America's network. C-SPAN is a nonprofit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service for its national cable